Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. I want to talk with two longtime friends today about Robert Kennedy and why he still inspires us after more than 50 years since his death. Steve Eisenberg is a lawyer who in 1968 worked in the city's budget bureau. And Jerry Kretschmer, also a lawyer, was then a member of the New York State Assembly. We later all worked for Mayor John Lindsay. Steve is Mayor Lindsay's chief of staff and Jerry as an administrator of the city's Environmental Protection Agency, and I as the mayor's special assistant. We've each moved on in many directions. Steve Eisenberg published newspapers, including New York Newsday, served as interim president of Adelphi University, executive director of Penn American Center, and is a much sought after visiting professor. Jerry became a developer of luxury and affordable housing and owner of many famous restaurants. And I, among other things, was elected to the city council and served for 12 years. Welcome. All right. Thank you. It's so amazing that Robert Kennedy is so relevant today. And I think that goes back to why he inspires us so much. Who wants to tell me first what you think? Go ahead, Jerry. Well, to me, it was accessibility, the thing about Bobby, that, you know, we go back to 64. You have to remember that we, he, he, was, he, he was ambitious. We, were, we felt very inveigling that we wanted to get this guy to come and be our candidate for the Senate. And so we, we and because it was a small movement, we had the luxury of getting to know him very early on in a real way. I've worked for a lot of candidates that I never knew anything about. But, but we knew Bobby because he came to see us. He, he, he engaged with us. He listened to our ideas. He had a lot of ideas of his own that were different than our ideas. But we always were able, either directly and sometimes not so directly, to get what we were thinking to him and before him. And we were all sort of at least, <laughs> if not entirely on this, in the same place, we were most of the time in the same place. And it was easy to have a discourse and to figure out what was going to happen because he was very open. I think we should remember that, as old as we are, that things began with President Kennedy for us. And so deep in our emotional reservoir was the coming of age of mm -hmm. uh, President John Kennedy and the deep shock of his assassination. Um, and once 1968 opened, uh, we felt many of us who felt so deeply against the war and the course of the war and its pernicious effects, a need to challenge a sitting president. It's almost unthinkable today to go after an incumbent, an incumbent uh, with the strength and reach then of Lyndon Johnson. So McCarthy was the first to come forward. And I think we can remember many of us, however naive I was, our own impatience that Bobby Kennedy had not jumped into that race. And um, we needed a champion. We needed someone who was going to take on the president. I, we come at it from different points right. of view, because Jerry and I were already very political on the west side of Manhattan. And we liked, as he said, we wanted him to come and run for the Senate. Uh, and we also were very active. We were older than you are, and to be frank. I mean, we are older than you, <laughs> even though you do have the gray hair, white hair. But anyway, um, we, so we got to know him that way. We campaigned for him. He won the Senate. And as Jerry said, he was so open. You remember when he met, we met him at the bar at the old Sheridan? Right. Remember it was the day the Pope had come? And Fred Ornstein, who was the state senator, arrived late, and he said, oh, my God. God, it's Erif Yom Kippur. You'd think the city wouldn't get so tied up. And, and Kennedy said, well, it may be the Pope. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just that kind of thing. And there we were in a bar or in another bar. Or if we called it, you know, we knew how to call him. And when we said we wanted to meet with him, we met with him. And then, of course, we went through this whole thing of the Dump Johnson movement where we were very active in that and kept asking him to run. Right. And actually, I helped organize the McCarthy thing. Uh, but then I went immediate to Kennedy. And you're right about, I think, the mystique. There was something about John Kennedy and his age. And to those of us who were 
especially politicians, aspire, you know, it was just, it was, it was the glamour. And of course, he didn't disappoint us. There's no doubt about that. But, but he did a good job. Yeah. That, that's the thing, the thing that held us to him was that we had some ideas, he had some ideas, but he was really good at, he, he told his story, he had a good story, people believed that he really cared about, there has been no politician since who really can convince all the people, no matter who they are, Did that they are in fact somebody that he, is, that he was and will, would be concerned about. And so that was his magic, that he was, he sort of threw a blanket over everybody and... And, and, and during the campaign, and you saw this because you originally wanted to take a leave of absence to work for McCarthy. <laughs> no, I didn't. What happened was <laughs> I did, I, everybody used to meet around town, mm -hmm. was going up to New Hampshire. And I went to my boss, Frederick O'Reilly Hayes, who was <laughs> the budget director, and said, I'd like to get in the campaign. You're right. And then he took me out to dinner and he asked me, do you think that Gene McCarthy should be president? I mean, it's a grown-up question. I hadn't really thought it through. And I said, no, I, I, I don't think he'd be the right person for that. And I said, well, I want Kennedy, and he's being, you know, chicken, and he's not getting into it. And Fred said to me, again, very worldly, he's got a lot more to lose. So um, I did. I wound up going into the campaign and going out to Oregon. But I think we should remember when John F. Kennedy was assassinated, our innocence was shattered, and it was a broken dream. And once there's somebody else can come along and five years later to revive again the dream, the hope. Um, and I think the other thing that was remarkable about Kennedy, we ought to remember, here we are, I'm in my late 70s, you both are in your 80s. No, you don't have to say that. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's so obvious. <laughs> I beg your pardon. <laughs> <laughs> well, the point being that, um, uh, we ought to remember how young John Lindsay was and how young Bobby Kennedy was. And both of them stand for me as people who continued to grow. Grow in their sensibilities, grow in their political understanding, grow in the sympathies they extended, especially to people who were unrepresented, who weren't at the table. It's that capacity for growth that I think almost comes right through to people. I think you touched on something, and this is um, what we go back to, why he's so relevant today, and what was so touching and really touched your heart then, is that he cared about people, and he really fought for those people who didn't have the power, really. Um, and he, he crossed everything. He knew the working class white. He knew the, Af the black people, the people in Appalachia. I mean, he was there, and want, you knew he wanted to change the world. We'll talk about Lindsay in another program, but he really wanted to change the world, and he believed that we could. But his instincts for the moment were so incredible. Just remember, the speech that he made after Martin Luther King was murdered is that probably was incredible. Is one of the most famous speeches ever made by a politician as sort of a eulogy, and it was so important because just, just how about a guy who can really prevent people from, from going out and rioting by, with his own words because they trusted him. The thing about Bobby is that you could basically believe that he was going to do what he said he was going to do, and, and that, was, that was my charm, I mean, with him, is that if, I, if he told me he would do something, he did it way more often than any other politician was likely to do if, if it was a difficult thing to do. And he did a lot of difficult things. And he, he, you know, I always knew about him, him because he hung, I mean, even when he was attorney general, because he had pictures his kids painted on the walls in his office. And it was that touch and that informality. But later when you saw him with people, especially children, and you certainly see that in the, that series now on Kennedy, how much attention he paid to people that he thought didn't have that much attention paid to them. Do you remember if a little girl or a little kid had freckles, he would bend down and say, you know, I love freckles, or I wear eyeglasses too. His empathy was so obvious, I think. But, but it was also, everybody was attracted to him. My, my favorite Kennedy story, besides my stories from Indiana, which I won't bore everybody with. Well, you can my, tell us. My some. favorite Kennedy story happened right on 73rd Street and um, Broadway. Broadway, and right in the triangle right. there. That we were having a big rally for him, 
and the crowd was just moving closer. He was sort of standing there with a microphone on top of the truck, and he was just, and he was, the crowd was pushing in on him, and so Rafer Johnson picked him up and put him on top of the car. I mean, that And that was, was the beginning of his campaign. That's right. all they did. They had to hold him. Right. Right. They, yeah. they, but that because people really got him. They haven't, there's no politician since that people have believed they and trusted to touch him. and understood him, mm. and they wanted to touch him. That's mm. exactly, because yeah. he touched them in a different way, but he touched all Do of you them. think his having survived a tragedy in his life, with I no think question. that connected with everybody, no right? He, yeah. he, he was, he that was, was part of the... He was back to make up for one mm -hmm. thing that we lost. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you a story from the other end of the country. <laughs> I ran a county called well, Columbia tell us, County. They, you went in and finally volunteered for the campaign, and before yeah. you know it, you're sent out to Oregon with no experience at all. Nothing. None. And <laughs> no one asked me had I ever been in a campaign. But I was on the flight out there with a man wearing a PT-109 <laughs> tie clasp, and I walked up to him and said, are, are you with the campaign? And he was a kind of gruff Irishman, and he uh, asked me where I was coming from and what did I, what was my work? And I told him I worked for Lindsay in the Budget Bureau, and he said, are you a whore at a garden party? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I'm a Democrat. <laughs> and I was sent out to see by Fred, uh, Bill Van Hoovel was running Oregon. And they gave me a county, a very tiny county, with no instruction or anything, just go up and run it. But I got a stop in the county, the county seat of St. Helens, and they came deadhead because you couldn't fly in. It was about 30 miles from Portland. And as we went down the main street in a convertible, people were lining the streets, and I tried to get some people out of factories and everything to come. And we're going down the street, and a guy walks up, walks up to the car, and he reaches in to give Bobby a handshake, kind of a mano a mano moment. He really wants to handshake. And then he says, my wife just got her hair done. She's sitting in that pickup truck over there, but she doesn't want to get out. Would you come over and say hello? And he jumped out of the car, and he did it. And of course, the media flew out of the bus. So great. So you were in Gary, Indiana. Gary, Indiana. They sent you out there. I, at the airport, coming back from uh, Memphis after Martin was killed, and we marched, and I called Dorothy to say I, was, I got here, and she said, Steve Smith is looking for you. And what does he want? Steve Smith was Bobby Kennedy's brother-in-law and the camp manager of the campaign. He said, they need you to go to Indiana. And I said to Dorothy, I can't go to Indiana. The legislature's in session. She says, leave me out of it, call Steve. <laughs> So I called them and they convinced me to go to Indiana. And as a matter of fact, they, for one vote in the legislature, they flew me from Gary, Indiana. We drove to Chicago, they flew me to Albany, and we flew back because they wanted me to be there. But the, the thing that most impressed me was how much confidence they had in people like me and our ability to do the job that they wanted us to do. I left Gary, I, I went to Indianapolis where John Douglas was running the campaign, the judge's son. And there was nothing for me to do in Indianapolis. And I said, I'm going back or I'm getting out of here. And he said, what do you want to do? I said, I want to go somewhere and get something organized. And I went to Gary, the Lake County Congressional District. It was Gary, uh, East Chicago, and uh, Hammond. And in that time, I, I left the headquarters with three checks, signed with no amount of money in them so I could go up and open a headquarters. <laughs> to this day, I have the third check on the wall in my office <laughs> with a telegram from Bobby announcing that he was going to run for president. <laughs> it's my most favorite. And then the second most favorite is the, the picture of Bobby that she sent, that Ethel sent yeah. after, the Christmas <laughs> after yeah. he was killed. But you know, also campaigning was so different. Well, you could get it him out. It was so important, wasn't it? Because it involved everybody. Everybody well, had a role. There was, the television played a much smaller role. It played a big role, but a much smaller role. And there was no other way to communicate. You had to do something that got you in the newspaper the next morning, and the only way that you could do that was to go out and say something smart the night before to a crowd of people. And so the job of the people in every campaign, besides canvassing at households, which was difficult, was to make sure that every stop, whether it was in the afternoon or in the evening or, the next, or early in the morning, had something in it that he could say that, that would impress the press enough so that they would write about it for the next day's paper. And that was, that was what an on-the-ground campaign was all about. How many people can you get them to? 
How quickly can you get him in and out of there? How, what is he going to say so that nobody in the crowd gets angry? But it was, it, and it was all organized by people like us, Ronnie. Yeah. I mean, there was. It was amazing. I, I went, I was told to go meet him at LaGuardia um, because he was taking the shuttle down to D.C. to work on his speech because he was announcing the next day that he was going to run. And of course, he was very self-conscious and worried about the response of the McCarthy people. We walked around there talking. He was sort of giving me instructions about what I should say to McCarthy people. We're back and forth. And, and the line was growing to get on the shuttle, but there were a bunch of young kids over to the right. I'll never forget this. And of course, he thought every young kid would be from McCarthy, and he was a little afraid. I said, go over and shake their hands. What could happen? So he walked over, and he shook their hands, and everybody was thrilled, you know? And then the stewardess, somebody said, do you want to go on the plane ahead? And he, I said, no, we're staying here, which he was perfectly happy to do. He was always anxious to meet people. Because he was, he, was, he was magnetic. Right. The one thing that, that I said. And he had a wonderful sense of humor. Right, that there's been no politician in my time who had that same magnetism about him. He just, I know this sounds really corny, but he had a halo. And, and people got it. They just got it. At they, the same time, he was not, he looked, you know, he was, he just looked modest, do you remember? I mean, well, the, he was very, the night before he was nominated, we thought he looked like a frightened deer yeah, or something. Right. Jerry, you represented, when you went out to Gary, it was basically an African-American Gary was, audience. but Hammond and East Chicago were, were yeah. very, very white. Yeah. And you white. were in Oregon where it was mostly white. Uh, so was the message different and how did it differ? I don't, I wasn't there, so, but I don't, I think his message was steady wherever he went. Um, I, I want to just offer your listeners something. You know, if you pick up and raid uh, Norman Mailer's Miami and the Siege of Chicago. I don't think there's any book quite like it that brings you into the politics of that year. You know, the suburban smuggery of the Republicans at their convention, the chaos of the Democratic convention. And I was reading the other night, there's a couple of terrific pages where Mailer meets Bobby for the first time. He describes him as somebody between an uh, Mickey Rooney and James Dean talks about his size and his velvety eyes. It, it's Mailer at his best. <laughs> but and is it puts... Bobby at his best? <laughs> <Yeah>. Well, no. <don't> you... <laughs> Bobby. You know who also best. wrote a very good book is Lawrence O'Donnell about the year. It's a great book because it takes every camp and puts it all together. Jerry, what was it like campaigning there? Uh, well, it was it was it was very special. But you know. There was, it was easy to create. We get a lot of credit, but it was easy to create the excitement. It was hard to win that primary, but it was easy to create that excitement. The, the thing about it was that we were in an area in Lake County where the state chairman was the congressman, and it was just a really complicated time. But we got through it all and because he got through it all. He never, he never, we, they decided for whatever the reason that that county, Lake County, was a very important place for them. And so and in those days, they, they used to fly in the Otter, the airplane that came up and down with a very short landing. And they'd come, back, they'd come into town, they'd go somewhere else, and then they'd come back at night into, in, into Gary because they really wanted to win that county. And so we did win the county. And he was really appreciative. And the next thing that happened is that I was supposed to go to California. Because now I was really in it. You know, the legislature no longer counted. <laughs> I didn't care about anything except making Bobby the president. I came back to New York to get some clothes and head to California. I called, Steve called me again and he said, you better stay in New York. We have to win that primary and too. How? That was... And how? And so, that, so I stayed in New York and we had a headquarters, I don't know whether you remember this, at 39th and Madison in an old restaurant. Right. And we worked day after and, uh... day after day to... to and, then, and, and we had a big challenge in New York, but we can uh, go into that another time. Right, okay. No, it's just, but, it, but, it, but <laughs> yeah. you did, the, my, the point about going here and going there is we had, we, he came first, we, because he was so serious and important to us, he came first. I don't think that there's any other politician in my lifetime who, who attracted people so that their belief in him was such 
that that was the thing in their mind all the time that they were trying to get that done. There, was no, there, there were no distractions. He, it was also his humility, and he lost to Oregon. He lost so to Oregon. That's about the that. first time the Kennedys ever, ever lost. lost a race. And uh, it was a very different setting because Bobby, you'll remember, had been the lead counsel on the McClellan Committee and testified in the prosecution of former mayor and sheriff uh, uh, Shrunk, his name was. So the unions in Oregon were very hostile uh, to Bobby. And then there was a nascent Humphrey movement, because by this time, Johnson, Johnson of was course, out. Had, was out of the race. And uh, McCarthy had uh, a, a very strong following there. And so it was a state that didn't have a happy political ending. But let me tell you something I obviously will never forget. I had this very small county. And then I was moved into Portland, but it won. And we all went to bed that night that the primary was ending and it was lost because we're getting up early in the morning to fly to Los Angeles. Two o'clock in the morning, my phone rang and I heard a voice go, Steve, this is Bobby. Four counties won tonight and one was yours. <laughs> I have a memory like an elephant sitting in Los Angeles. <laughs> and it's the last we would ever speak. He had this humility in a way, in this person who was so admired and people wanted to touch and everything. He was still, he was still a humble person in a way. The other thing that was mar remarkable about him, and in such contrast, is he, had, he said, we've come, I mean, you knew he was very wealthy, <laughs> but he felt because he was wealthy, he had to do even more for the public and for people. And the, I'm, I've been thinking about, is there such a thing as the public good? But he had to do more for the people who needed his help. And I think that is such a different thing. Well, one of the things that we haven't really talked about is how he changed from the beginning of his career when he was the attorney general till he became the senator and from becoming the senator. Becoming the growing. Senator, that, right. all, all the time. That, mm -hmm. so, so, and we really respected that change because we were really mad. I, for one, was mad at him when he was the attorney general. I mean, and I was even more mad at him in the McCarthy times. He was so clever, I guess, is an understanding of our feelings that he managed to take us out of our original feelings and convert them to these really strong feelings about him. And then the magic was that it, those feelings just grew. The, I, mm -hmm. the, the greatest shock of my life of my life to date is when he was killed. I, I've, I've grieved as much for other things, but the greatest shock of my life, because just on a personal note, I was planning to be in Washington, I was <laughs> planning to work for him, I was planning to be involved in the government of the United States, I was going to leave the legislature behind, and I was going to have this big, really important career making America bigger, <laughs> because he was going to be the president. And I really believed that. I mean, that's what I wanted. Mm -hmm. The reason that we still think about him and grieve and just are so dedicated to him, um, do you think the world would have been different if he had won? <laughs> I, th I think we all agree to that. That, that happened. I think but what a, should we look for? I think in a time where the country has such divisibility and is so fraught and where politicians can look so small and mean and coarse, Bobby was a tough guy. Um, but and he had pragmatic, a, very yeah, pragmatic. But I think he was seeking something larger and holding out at least the possibility that the things that divided us could not necessarily be forgotten, but they could have been overcome in some way. Mm -hmm. And the unfinished businesses of life, when people are taken young, we you never know. forget it. Mm -hmm. Lost in war, mm -hmm. lost by assassination. Um, and he held such hopes for us. Yeah. That was it. I mean, that we really, I, I, I think I said it a couple of minutes ago, we really believed that it was going to be better, it was going to be different, that the country was going to come together, that all of these problems, that the death of Martin would have not, not be in vain, and that, that, that his role was going to be to unite all of those people. And we just believed it, and we believed that racism would, would go away, and I don't know if any of that would have ever happened, but I know, I yeah. know that that's what we believed. And he showed us the the fact that you've got to feel it in your heart, and it isn't just a political game, it's really 
um, what we should all be doing. I mean, he always brought in his church and philosophy, and he were here to help each other. We were very lucky, I think, weren't we, to have met him and known him? We sure were. And I thank you both for coming. It was really terrific, and we could go on forever talking about him, couldn't we? I could. Yeah. I could. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.